the things that is quite apparent with every project, and, and I read a quote by D.H. Lawrence that said, when you're creating a book, sometimes you have to trust the story, not just the author. And I thought it was such a great thing because every project essentially teaches you something. This lecture is about acoustics, it's about volumetrics, it's about neuroscience, and it's about the perception of space and essentially how we play with these different elements. We're based in London, uh, this is our office. But I'm, I'm gonna talk to you about three materials that we use, and I keep calling them building materials, which is light, reflection, and sound. Um, and these are materials that we essentially manipulate to do something with the architecture, to sort of give it a deeper, wider um, kind of effect. And this is something that um, I wrote very long time ago, but it's something that I keep thinking about when doing projects. Light, just like music, it's like pulse, um, it's the witness of time, it's the metaphor of life. So a building really comes alive uh, with light, and a concert hall really comes alive with music. How, how do we manipulate light? First of all, it has to be captured. So I love this picture, which is essentially the water in the air capturing the light. Um, Jim Terrell is a wonderful um, artist who has understood and manipulated light in ways that has influenced many of us. Um, Endo, Nendo, the, this transparent lamp where you kind of use light to essentially remove all sense of structure and gravity. And I think that's something that we do use quite a bit in our projects. If you look at the way architecture and music has evolved, there is quite a linear, linearity between them. When the aristocracy were uh, commissioning the music um, to be played in their living rooms or chamber orchestras, you can see the, the architecture being very sort of flourished. You kind of move on to the classical style, the 18th century, um, Hayden and, and uh, Beethoven, and the instruments become bigger, the grand piano comes into play, and the volumes become bigger. And this is when you started to develop the um, um, the, the Musikverein, for example, in Vienna, it's considered one of the best acoustic spaces. And this is before we had all the programs that we now have for, um, to understand the acoustics. They kind of did it through trial and error and realized that this box of 45 by 23 by 20 was really the box for, for uh, the, the premium acoustics and sort of was essentially repeated through the 19th century as the perfect acoustic space. And then came Sharoon and Sharoon kind of changed everything. Sharoon is, we consider him the, the Corbusier of, of, uh, of, of architecture in terms of uh, concert halls because he moved away from the shoebox and, and went into the vineyard style and, and did this concert hall in, in the, the Philharmonie in Berlin, also considered one of the best acoustic spaces um, where not, none of the floors are straight, every, everything angles slightly, and then the people are essentially organized around the orchestra. And so there's a much more intimate relationship between the musician and the audience. The computer technology and the understanding, the physics of, uh, of acoustics was, was evolving. And we started looking at it in a much more sort of engineered way rather than a, a, an intuitive way, the way we had for centuries. We had a project uh, in Andermatt Concert Hall and the project was all about boundaries. Um, essentially, the project was so bad at the beginning that I nearly thought I wasn't gonna do it because I didn't think I could deliver something good. But essentially we were given um, a, a a bunker, which was supposed to be a ballroom for a hotel underground. And the client said, can you give me an acoustician? I want to turn it into a concert hall. And I said, I'll give you the acoustician if you give me the project. I got the project. Um, and then uh, essentially he said, well, here we have this underground bunker, um, this space, and we want to create, um, we want to turn it into a concert hall. Um, and can you do some acoustic stuff on the walls and decorate it a bit and, and, and turn it into a concert hall. And, you know, going there, I realized actually the volume is all wrong, the shape is all wrong, there's no natural light. Um, it's sort of absolutely terrible. This is the state of which it was in when we found it. And it was, you could see that it was essentially designed as a ballroom and essentially um, really didn't work. So 
I said to the client, look, it doesn't work. We need a bigger volume for the acoustics. We, we need more space. We, you know, he, he had ambitions of putting a 75 piece orchestra. I said, you could put a four or five piece orchestra uh, chamber music in there. And then I flew him to Berlin to see the opening of the uh, Baron Boyne uh, Divan Hall, which had exactly the same plan. But the volume, um, the, it had 13.5 meters compared to the six and a half meters uh, that we had. And we kind of sat around the different spaces and I explained to him how acoustics and volume and visual all work together and how important that was. And so he then understood. Um, but we had this other challenge that we had to build it in 18 months, design and build it, because they had a big opening then. Um, and we couldn't um, get new planning because planning in Switzerland takes years and we couldn't do new foundations because that would be too expensive. So we had all these limitations. So we found a way that if we stand behind this line, this green line, which is a Swiss planning thing, um, and we cut the roof open and we lift the roof up. And then if we hang a backpack to it, we could essentially increase the volume significantly. And then what I also thought intuitively is that if you see bigger, you will hear bigger. And there was something so special about creating a concert hall in the Alps in Switzerland. There were no concert halls. I mean, they're small chamber music things, but they weren't proper concert halls that were able to um, accept an orchestra like the Berlin Philharmonic, which they wanted to do. So I thought, well, we really need to bring the mountains into this concert hall. It has to be absolutely special. But more importantly for, for us was this thing that if you saw this much larger space, the music would feel much larger and much bigger. And that was all theoretical. And, um, and you know, we, we went along with it. And this was an early sketch, very, very early on. Um, and then we thought, well, it's, it's there, but it's not quite there yet. And then we started working with, we had eight acquisitions on this job and we started working with an acquisition. We put the stage in the center, we wrapped the people around it. So, so this intimacy occurred, but then we wanted the, the, if you have a 75 piece orchestra in a volume of that size, you, you're gonna be sort of overwhelmed by, by the music. And so we started looking at this electroacoustics and that was very interesting because what it does is it doesn't amplify music. It doesn't change the music. All it does is we have something like um, 75 speakers all around. We have 125 um, microphones everywhere. And all it does is it takes the music and throws it. So the natural acoustics works and throws it back sort of microseconds later and dupes your brain into thinking that the space is bigger. So we said, this is great theoretically. We went to see a space and we tried the system. And what it was extraordinary is actually when you change the system, the space started looking bigger, physically looking bigger. And it was obviously it hadn't changed. And then once you went too much, once you put it on cathedral setting, your brain went, no, no, now you're fooling me and it all fell apart. So there was this very slight moment when you can actually fool your brain into um, understanding the space. And what it, what, made, what it made us realize is actually you perceive, you perceive space through your eyes and through your ears. If you're in a closet, you know you're in a closet. If you're in a cathedral, you know you're in a cathedral. You don't need to open your eyes. So that's quite obvious. But what this did is it took our hall and acoustically amplified it to a much bigger hall, which meant that they could actually accept much larger orchestras. And what we've done is we've left it to the conductors to decide what uh, reverberation times they want and and how they want to use it and and the natural acoustics work perfectly but if they want to uh, heighten or change it um, they, they can do that and what's interesting is actually when we design for acoustics we design for the orchestra the audience understands but the ones who really understand are the musicians and so they always um, calibrate their concert hall before any concert to sort of suit them perfectly for the type of music they will be playing for um, and for the size of the orchestra so that was um, in the hall before the change. And this is the same view after the change. So obviously the space grew quite dramatically, but what was really important uh, was really this sense that you were sitting inside and you could see 
what was going on outside. And this notion that you can see the cable cars going up and you can see the mountains and in the summer the cows are grazing and imagine a winter when there's a blizzard and you're listening to music and you have this interaction with the outside was very important and it sort of um, aligned with this electroacoustics which made the space feel bigger and now visually um, it is bigger. What was um, difficult is we had to actually design the glass for this because of the acoustic requirements. We couldn't find uh, a single glass, I mean, this is triple glaze, but a single glass pane that could deal with the 50 dB requirements that we had. And then we, we worked with the glazing manufacturers to get the right dB rating for certain decibels and were able to get this very, very transparent glazing uh, bespoke for, the, for this particular project. Um, this is the plan. So you can see how we grew the plan from a small box to something slightly bigger. This is seen from the street. Um, and the, it's a very modest building when you go there. It's a tiny little pavilion, I would call. But actually, down below, it's, it's quite a large concert hall um, and essentially um, works as such. The, the whole shaping of the, um, the concert hall, all of this origami is very much done for the acoustics. So everything is angled according to the acoustic requirements and to get the, the right level of, of, of spreading of, of the sounds throughout the hall. And you can see how we've integrated all the microphones and speakers to sort of not be visible. And this notion that you are sitting in a hall and looking at the mountains being so important. And all of these panels, some of them are acoustically transparent, some of them are reflective. All of this is sort of designed in a very sort of technical manner, but, uh, but the result is something that sort of is very simple and, and um, un uncomplicated.